Hello, welcome again to Fair Tax Power Radio. I'm Bob Paxton. And I'm Ron Molero. And we are the, the Fair, Fair Tax, Tax guys. guys, and we have got a treat for you today. Remember the CPA from Colorado? We've that, mentioned him before. That wrote us a little short note that was two pages single space. Yeah. <laughs> He's here. We're yeah. going to talk to him today. Yeah, all the way from Colorado. This is great. It just happened. He was here in Florida on business and agreed to come to the studio today for the interview. It works out great because we've talked about CPAs before, but now we have one in the studio that can go into in-depth why CPAs are in favor of the fair tax. This is wonderful. Yes, this is really good to see this from a CPA's perspective, and I think you'll learn a lot. So let's just dive right in here with our interview with Jade Wally. And Fairtax Power Radio is pleased and honored today to be talking with Jade Wally. You may remember the name. This is the gentleman that wrote us a, quote, short note that was two pages, single space. Jade, we appreciate you coming by and talking to us today. It's a great honor to be here, Bob. All right. You're from Colorado, and you're in Florida on business. I am. And we certainly, again, we appreciate you coming by here for certain. And uh, now, Ron wants to ask you the first question. I have no clue what he's got up, up his sleeve for you, but hang on. Yeah, well... <clears throat> it what struck me among other things in, in both your email to us and in the article that you wrote for Fair Tax Friday was the streak of independence that runs through Americans. You know, one of the things that that occurs to me is that the country one of the founding principles was the sovereignty of the individual, and I think that speaks to that streak of independence and how it, and how people perceive the income tax. Can you expand on that? Sure, Ron. Um... You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question because the income tax, by its very nature, um, swirls around what, what we call in the world of auditing the fraud triangle. And we think about what that means. So the fraud triangle is a simple concept to try and articulate when fraud might occur. Fraud being intentional defalcation or misstatement of financials or misappropriation of assets, stealing, in other words. And so three things that have to be present when fraud is occurring, you've got to have opportunity. If the cash register drawer is locked, you don't have the opportunity. You've got to have incentives or pressures and rationalization and justification. So when we think about the income tax, and we can probably all relate to stories we've had with neighbors or others, maybe it's a business owner of some kind, but or maybe even relatives, unfortunately. But we can all probably recall conversations when we've talked with someone about how they've not avoided but evaded income taxes uh, inappropriately. And then you, th you hear the reasons why, the rationalization, the justification start coming in. Well, the government takes too much of my money anyway. And wh what do they really do for me? I, I never saw Uncle Sam show up and put on an apron at my, at my counter at my business. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can just, you can feel it and see it um, from the rationalization justification. From the opportunity perspective, how many individual income tax filers do we have? 140 million, something like something that? Something like that, yeah. Another 20 million business corporate filers. Just the individual points of audit. And oh, by the way, how many people does it take to cheat? Just just one with an income tax return, right? Of course, we, we can get into the fair tax later, but with the fair tax, it takes much more collusion with, with multiple people, a, a, a retailer and a buyer. So, so you, can, you can see with the fraud triangle of where we see fraud in the world of public accounting and financial statements, these aspects, these traits, if you will, are smack dab at the center of the income tax. And there's an interesting quote from Adam Smith, author of Wealth of the Nations back in the 1700s, and he said, the property which every man has in his own labor, as it is the original foundation of all other property, so it is the most sacred and inviolable. And so what I think Adam Smith is getting to, maybe in some old English mm -hmm. terminology there, is the fruit, the sweat of your brow, the fruit of your labor is exactly um, the most important and inviolable. It's, it's, it's something that's so sacred to you. And what, how do we feel when our income is taken? That's someone taking our property. And right or wrong, that's the law. We've got to comply with it now. But that's the way people feel. And that's why we have, what, 25% evasion rate, $693 billion oh, a year. It, it's insane. And that's the one thing that a lot of these other tax proposals that are on the table now, they, they do meticulously avoid talking about that. <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit later. But first, one thing I want to get into. Now, you are a professional CPA. I am. Been doing it for how long? 
Oh, I've, I've been a CPA since 1997, um, licensed in three states. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm interested in a CPA's perspective of the fair tax, because we hear all the time, you won't find a single CPA in the country that'll like this idea, because you're going to put them all out of business. Explain to folks why that's not true. Um, sure, sure, absolutely. Well, I, I find that folks with, with the fair tax, uh, a lot of folks, they don't realize um, all the research behind it. $22 million of research, the most researched piece of potential oh, yeah. legislation. We've in hit history. on that a good bit here. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you look at that research and start diving in, and, and man, 99% of it's there on fairtax.org mm-hmm. or, or bigsolution.org, um, you look at the effects of the economy. And you can read it in the original fair tax books by Neil Bortz and John Linder. But when I when I read that, it, I'll be honest, Bob. I, I my I'm I'm supposed to be professionally skeptical. That's part of auditing standards. I'm that's that's my that's uh, I, that's what I'm tasked with. And so I was a little skeptical at first when I heard about all the the economic um, boom that will happen, the rocket fuel for the economy, mm-hmm. etc. And then I start digging into the research papers. You know, some of them are six, some of them are eight, ten pages long on fairtax.org, but they're a great read. And then what you see is that the PhDs, uh, multiple PhDs, very independent and objective of mine because they they're just factual. They don't have a they don't have an a, a, an agenda. They 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 show these statistics that just blow your mind as far as what a national consumption tax will do for the economy relative to our income tax. And so what I think about is trillions of offshore dollars coming back into the United States because there's no, there's no repatriation tax or there's no corporate tax. Um, what I think about is GDP going up. Let me, let me look at some of these numbers here. GDP would go up by 2.4% in year one and by 11% by year 10 after the fair tax. And That's that, a and big that, number. <laughs> huge. Consumption up 2.4% two, two year one, up 12% by year 10. Disposable personal income. That's really the bottom line for everyone. Uh-huh. Up 2% in year one, 9% in year five, up 12% by year 10 after fair tax enactment. Real wages up 10% in years one, 10, 25. And, and we can go on and on with these statistics. But so as I dug in further, I, I realized, okay, Jade, this maybe this there's these PhDs are certainly smarter than I am. And, and so maybe there's something to this. It's not just a bunch of optimistic hoo-ha, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, coming, coming from, um, you know, the, the AAFT or the supporters' mouths. So one, one thing, virtually all economists agree that three items will promote economic growth. What are those three items? Replacing the income tax with a consumption tax. Check. Uh, replacing a graduated rate system with a flat marginal tax rate system. Check lower marginal rates and a broader tax base. And, and we can touch on this later, but to me, when I'm explaining to my CPA colleagues, a $9 trillion consumption tax base compared to a $5 trillion income tax base, that's really one of the magic keys, along with the prebate, but those are the magic keys of the fair tax. So I, I rationalized and thought through um, all of these items and brought the question back around. Well, well Jade, there's... A, there's approximately about a million folks, a million CPAs and or tax accountants in, in America that would be affected by the fair tax enactment. Mm-hmm. About, I don't know, 88,000, 90,000 IRS employees is 10% of that, of that $1 million, <laughs> $1 million folks. Um, and you have to think, you know, there, there would be some, some disruption for those folks that are purely income tax code driven. Yeah. And, and I work with corporations, mostly public companies. All the time, and sometimes there's floors of of accountants, not just bookkeepers, but but the actual tax accountants. And so you have to think, okay, there there would be some disruption there. And but these are smart people; they'll find something else to where they can fit in. Absolutely, Bob. So you think about, especially the CPAs, a, a, a large preponderance of these million folks are well educated CPAs, very dynamic. Besides, you yeah. know, other than the, the sitcom representation of a CPA that has glasses, yeah. and, 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 and that's why I wore contacts today, by the but way. But CPAs do so much more than just taxes. I that, mean, if you take the tax part away, you still got a pretty good chunk of business to deal with. Absolutely. Like, for example, I, I, I'm not a tax accountant, but, but, but I'm a CPA. So I think the preponderance of folks would, 
very much land on their feet. And I, I joke with my tax colleagues at my firm and I say, we've got jobs for you in audit. Just, just come on over after the fair tax is enacted. You'll be, you'll be taken care of. All right. Well, well, our little catchphrase here on Fair Tax Power Radio, you've heard it for sure. Once you understand it, you'll demand it. Have you found that to be true when you explain the fair tax to people who are not familiar with it? Absolutely. Um, I've, I've taught a, a graduate practicum course at, at a university for the past three years and dragged a couple of my colleagues along. Um, it's one of these deals where they ask professionals to come back and, and, and teach a day of, of, of a course for, mm-hmm. for an accounting course. And I've done it on the fair tax for the last three years. And I, I try to do it very um, objectively. Um, here's what the proponents think. Here's what the opponents think. And at the end of the day, I ask for a show of hands. And this is, this is a long two and a half hour course. Yeah. And, and over half of the, the folks, um, when we say, well, again, we're neutral up here, but what, what do you think? about the fair tax and over half of them raise their tan- hand and say we'd like it now keep in mind some of the folks the students in this class are majoring a graduate degree in tax accounting with a focus in tax accounting i do find that because of the natural maybe it's a human preservation uh some of the folks with a with a tax concentration in their master's degree have a little bit more hesitation in raising their hand but a few of them have yeah, well, I know when I first explained the fair tax to my mom and gave her the fair tax book and she read the thing and she looked back at me and says, why aren't we doing this already? It makes so much sense. You Absolutely. see that on occasion, I'm sure, too. Absolutely. That, that's, your, your mother's conversation is almost identical to my brother and I's conversation. Uh-huh. And I explained it to him in detail. He, he'd ask the good um, you know, questions and, and uh, oh, wouldn't that be regressive? No, there's a prebate. It wouldn't be regressive, et cetera, et cetera. And at the, at the end of the conversation, like, yeah, why aren't we doing this? Well, I have found out that just about everybody who's out there shooting at the fair tax trying to knock it down are either purposely misrepresenting what it does and says, or they just don't know. And again, once these folks understand it, 98% of them like it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I'll give you a a, a quick story here, Bob. One of my colleagues, he's a capital markets expert, super smart. Um, I was working late one night. He came by wondering if we want to play tennis. I started explaining to him because his first thing, of course, was, wait a minute, consumption tax. It's going to kill the poor. It's the most regressive tax there is. And I said, you know, you're right. A, A sales tax by itself is the most regressive along with a federal gasoline tax. And, and by the way, this payroll tax. Yeah, the payroll tax is the most regressive tax that we pay because even if you don't have any income tax liability, you, don't, you can get that back if it's withheld from you. But you don't get back the Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes. And the fair tax does put those programs on a much better financial footing than the, than the folks. Right now, only people who work for a, for a paycheck who get W-2s are supporting that. With the fair tax, it'd support everybody would, would get there. Absolutely. I didn't mean to run you down that side road, but that's no. Well, I'd like to go back down that side road. I've got a go for interesting it. idea on that. But but anyway, my colleague at the end of it all, he what he again very capital mind capital markets minded had worked for some of the big banks in in New York as well before coming back to the firm. He's like, wow, wait a minute, this is encour- encouraging savings, which mm-hmm. in his world encourages investment, which in his world encourages deals, mm-hmm. and then encourages transactions. And so coming full circle back on your question around how would this benefit accountants, wow, if we have a GDP increasing by 10, 11% in 10 years, up 2.5% relative to the income tax in one year, we, it might be a year or two of, of transition to kind of figure ourselves out as accounting firms when we lose that tax line of service. But wow, if we've got businesses coming back into the United States, Fourteen trillion or so estimated. No one knows exactly. Off offshore mm-hmm. money kept outside of the United States coming back freely. I think yeah. Alan Greenspan was actually interviewed about the fair tax back in the last decade. Talked about how quick would that money come back, and yeah. other than some money that would stay for that legitimate plant you have in Costa Rica or wherever your businesses are, the vast majority would come back. And the timing was asked. And what did Alan Greenspan think? And was it going to be years or decades? No, it'd be like months. 
I think mm-hmm. is what Mr. Greenspan said as far as how fast that money would come yeah, well, back. Neil Bortz uh, references a study that was done for you know CEOs and CFOs of major international corporations, and they were asked what would happen if the fair tax became law in the United States, and like 40% of them said that you know we would build our next plant there, and the other 60% said, heck with that, we'd move to the United States. You're talking about bringing jobs and money back from off- offshore. That will do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, you bring up the, the, the wealthy and, and Social Security. I, I, I like to talk to folks about who, who would winners and losers be with the fair tax. Well, almost every demographic, when you look at it, gets more purchasing power. But I think there'd be that rare demographic of, let, let's call them the uber wealthy. And we think about as much as um, certain folks um, want to demagogue the rich, and, mm-hmm. and, and they need to pay their fair share and, and, and be taxed more. And that's a debate for a different day. But if that's the way we feel, why don't we have a system that taxes existing wealth? You can raise that income tax rate as high as you want, but your Warren Buffetts, your Mitt Romneys, or your maybe your Donald Trumps in his personal life, not as president, who are these uber wealthy folks, mm-hmm. how much are they contrib- contributing into Social Security? Zero, because I don't think they have a W-2. They don't. No payroll tax withheld. And so they're probably paying capital gains tax on large investments. But yeah. usually rich people spend like rich people. I don't know if they might get a, a, a yacht this year or, or, or a beautiful new home or whatever they end up spending on. Guess what? The Fair Tax Act, I've read it, calls for about 35% of the funds that come in to fund Social Security. Mm-hmm. So now those uber wealthy that don't pay a dime into Social Security... We can argue if that's right or wrong that they would now, but now they would pay their full burden into Social Security as those uber-wealthy spend. Mm-hmm. And remember, the uber-wealthy, some people say, well, they, they could save a lot. Well, consumption comes from four things. It comes from income. Okay, fine. And it comes from savings. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it comes, uh, it comes from borrowing and it comes from theft. We can't forget that. <laughs> Four things. People always say three. I, I add theft in there because then people spend what they steal. So, so if you think about it, yeah, people might say, but it eventually gets spent. Mm-hmm. And that all that consumption gets spent. So all yeah. that income, all that existing wealth turns into tax dollars as it's consumed. Mm-hmm. That's true. And these uber-wealthy people like you're talking about have the means and the wherewithal to hire folks like you to find the loopholes because, again, the tax code is so incredibly complicated that it takes a professional that does nothing but concentrate on that to find all of the legal loopholes that they can get into. And, of course, with a fair tax, it is just simply mathematically impossible for someone who spends more to pay a you know lower tax rate than someone who spends less, the Warren Buffett versus his secretary thing, you've heard about that. Yes, that yes. that's that's just if, if you want the rich to pay their fair share, you're for the fair tax. Absolutely, Th- this plan. I've thought about that because that that really kind of irks people. Wait, that secretary pays a higher rate, not more tax, but a higher rate than than Warren Buffett. That doesn't sound fair. Well, he's probably paying capital gains and has some charitable contributions, and the effective rate is probably fourteen, thirteen, twelve percent. And she's paying something higher. Well, the only plan that I've heard of that actually fixes that finally, once and for all, would be the fair tax. Because as Warren would spend more than his secretary, I know he lives conservatively in Omaha yeah. here, but but he was. It would be reasonable to assume yeah. he's spending and consuming more yeah. than his secretary, and if, he'll, his rate will be higher. If they were the same household size, that they'd both get the same prebate. But the secretary's uh, tax uh, burden would be covered more so by the prebate than his would. Because his prebate would be just a little minuscule bit of what he'd actually pay. So he t- the more you spend, the more you take out of your pocket, period. That's Absolutely. just the way the math works. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, Bob, I, I think a lot of folks don't understand. They think, oh, the rate's the same, so it must be regressive. And, and, and folks even get sideways in their thinking with the prebate. They still think it's regressive, and that's not yeah, true. Well, some folks think that's a handout and that, that it should be means-tested, and there goes all the simplicity if they try to do that. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, this, this, this just works really good with a fair tax. <laughs> Absolutely. Talk to me about this evasion thing. We've been banging on this on Fair Tax Power Radio for quite a while. That, uh, of course, avoidance, which is what you guys do legally, finding all the loopholes, Evasion. I bet you've seen some really neat, <laughs> neat probably is not the right word to use there, but some rather creative ways that people try to evade the income tax. What, what have you seen? 
Right. Now, again, I'm not a tax accountant, but I hear I hear stories. And, and admittedly, most of what I deal with is probably understanding how companies go through extensive work and extensive fees to my firm mm-hmm. to legally avoid income taxes, not evade, but, but legally avoid. And I can give you a few examples where, you know, I've got I've had a, a large client where they were um, – um, selling a, a, a natural gas utility and buying a pipeline and, and somehow we're able to work with, with some tax help, with some professional tax advisor help to turn that into what's known in the tax code as a like-kind exchange where you basically get to defer any gain on the sale of your asset and it's, it won't bore you with the details of the tax code, but it's it's a tax avoidance measure. And, and when you really think about the substance of a transaction and, and that, that rule is really meant for more you know, if you're selling a truck and buying a new truck for your business and you could, you could, you know, kind of defer the, the, the gain on the sale of that truck, etc. Mm-hmm. But the way, it was just very interesting to me to see the way teams and, and companies effectively and legally, it's, it's following the letter of the law, actually use the code to get certain advantages or preferable treatment under the code. And you couldn't have done that if you didn't have those high, high-powered uh um, tax advisors, and I'll tell you, like you guys spoke in the last episode seventy-seven about the GE fifty-three page tax, fifty-three thousand page tax return. Yes, and you know, my I was, I was curious about how much would it cost them to yes. get that prepared. <laughs> well, Bob, I was going to tell you, I guarantee you, my firm probably had something to do with that. I'm not sure, um, but it would have been millions and probably tens of millions c- coming to a, f- a firm like mine to help them. Get that fifty-three thousand pages together, mm-hmm. and ultimately with a zero tax liability. But but the compliance costs are there, which oh, maybe they paid zero to the federal government, but they they paid to that professional accounting firm, which ultimately went into the price of that washing machine or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm thinking, as the person who is preparing that fifty-three thousand page thing, you've got to be thinking somewhere in the back of your mind. The tax code is so complicated. Even though I have done as diligent and as thorough a job as I can possibly do on this thing, the IRS is probably going to find something to quibble about, and they're the judge and the jury. What ha- what kind of trepidation do these guys feel about being called on the carpet when you've done your best and you know that they're still going to find something to argue with, and they get to decide who's right? Well, that's a great question. I, I think in the corporate world, you you there's a little little less of that trepidation because as an individual, as that as that fifty um, year old man who has a small business and doesn't know a lick about the tax code, that's where that real fear. We fear what we don't know and mm-hmm. what we don't understand. These corporations, they've got tax accountants, they've got accounting firms. And, and, you know, some of these, Bob, they, they've just got a continual IRS auditor almost year round. They just year after year, they call it like a continual IRS audit program that a lot of these corporations go through. Yeah, it, it, they really they almost have permanent office space at some of these larger companies. Now, again, my firm and, and, and most of the other big accounting firms are fairly conservative. And we, we, we tend to, to, you know, land on the side of conservatism and not put our, our clients in a, mm-hmm. in a particularly aggressive position such that they could really be challenged. But you might find this as a surprise, Bob, but there's gray area. In oh, the yeah. 77,000 pages of tax code laws oh, and interpretations. You're I kidding. Yeah, I didn't know if you knew that. I, I never <laughs> thought that in a million years. There actually is gray area. I know yeah. that's a surprise. Yeah. But, but they... <laughs> Actually, we were talking before the show about this uh, tax uncertainty principle. Elaborate yes. on that. You bet. There's, there's an accounting standard um, called FIN 48, Financial Interpretation 48, which falls into the realm of GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles, which is more my world as opposed to an income tax world. But in your books, your balance sheet, your income statement, your statement of cash flows, and your financial statement footnotes, you follow GAAP. And the income tax consequences of your business fall into the books. You know, you got to have income statement treatment. You have balance sheet, deferred assets, uh, deferred tax assets, liabilities, etc. It gets very complex. But there's actually a GAAP accounting standard that's called uncertain tax positions, FIN 48. 
So I just find it funny that we have to have a gap accounting standard to deal with uncertain tax positions. So, Bob, even in those 77,000 pages, we couldn't figure it out enough to make a certain, Mm -hmm. which is just unbelievable. Well, I take it you've heard about that story that Money Magazine did. I mean, that was like 30 years ago where they took a mythical family and asked 50 different tax preparers, how much does this family owe, and got 49 different answers. Absolutely. And that was 30 years ago. The tax code is immensely more complex now than it was then. That should not surprise people absolutely it's 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 just utterly utterly confusing um, and you guys have mentioned on the show before the there's there's excerpts in the law that says you've got to understand the totality of the mm-hmm. whole 77,000 pages to understand this one little paragraph you're trying to apply <laughs> so I, I mean even even the sophisticated corporations can't do that Okay, a lot of good information there, and that's just part one of our interview with Mr. Wiley. We'll pick this up again in the next episode of Fair Tax Power Radio, but there was a lot of good stuff there. A lot of good stuff there. Uh, I'll go back to my first question, uh, actually my only question with him, uh, pertaining to people's attitudes towards the uh, the income tax. And that's very simple to summarize. They don't like it. <laughs> Wonder why. <laughs> Americans don't like the income tax. And, and he spells it out. Yes, it does relate to one of the founding principles, the individual sovereignty. And, it does, and he tied it into the evasion very quickly. I was surprised that he, he took that, the dislike for the income tax, and used that as a part of the justification for, for evasion. And that's a huge problem, as Bob and I have talked about several times before. Over 20% evasion, which costs the rest of us a whole lot of money. Uh, so I was, I was very interested in, to see what he said there. Yeah, but I'm thinking, you know, we the general taxpayers have to deal with this thing maybe once a year. Yeah. CPA's got to deal with this thing the entire year around. Yeah, 365 days a year. My gosh. Yeah, but I think he pretty well busted the myth that CPAs don't like the fair tax. Oh, yeah. Because they do a lot more than just doing the taxes. They can they can provide a lot more services to their clients that they don't have time to do now because they're all tied up with the tax code. And we have heard from other CPAs they really don't like the tax code, yeah. and they would love to get rid of it. Yeah, but I was amazed when he said that there's gray area in that 77,000 pages. I'd have never thought of that. <laughs> oh, what a, what a revelation. You know, who would have thunk it? <laughs> oh, mercy. I'll tell you what. But uh, as I say, that's part one. We'll be talking to Mr. Wiley again on the next episode of Fair Tax Power Radio. This is part two of our interview. Yep. So check that out. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And something else you need to check out uh, coming up this Monday. This Our yep. next Facebook Live event. Yep. Facebook Live. Uh, it will be on the Fair Tax Official Facebook page. And it's at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. You know, 7 o'clock Central and so forth, and actually 6 o'clock uh, Mr. Wally's uh, time. Uh, he's in the mountain time zone. Um, no telling what we're going to talk about because it's interactive. And when you type in questions, we respond. So it is interactive, and we follow the, the, uh, the, drift, uh, the direction of your questions. So it's a lot of fun. I know we have a lot of fun doing it. And I hope uh, our listeners uh, enjoy it, too. Yes, and if you'd like to follow Mr. Wally's footsteps and send us an email, thefairtaxguys at yes. gmail.com. And if you want to send one that's two, spe- two pages, single space, that's fine, too. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like us on Facebook. We have our Facebook page, The Fair Tax Guys. Check that out. And do do turn into the uh, to the Facebook Live. I think Mr. Wally may actually be talking with us on Monday as well. Yes. We'll see. I wouldn't be surprised if we heard from him. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's just about going to wrap it up. We've got a little bit of time here left. Anything else you want to get into real quick? Well, uh, don't forget on the fourth Thursday of the month is the webinar. Um, that's also interactive. Uh, there will be announcements on Facebook and so forth. Um, you, you can, And it's free for nothing for everybody. And you can type in your questions and they will give you answers. Mark and Larry from the Orlando area have been doing that for nine years now. So it's a, it's a good way to learn about it. And you can tell other people who may not be familiar with the Fair Tax, tune into Fair Tax Power Radio and tune into the webinar. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for this edition of Fair Tax Power Radio. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Bob Paxton. And I'm Ron Molero. We are the Fair Tax Guys, reminding you, as we always do, that the Fair Tax is America's big solution. And once you understand it, you'll demand it. Fair Tax is coming. 